On today's Newsmakers, actor Gary Sinise, Israel doubles down in a church's legal battle. That and more coming up. Welcome to Newsmakers, a show where we go behind the headlines each week to bring you interviews with pastors, entertainers, politicians, and other notable news figures. On today's Newsmakers, we are starting out with an exciting interview. It is Gary Sinise. He's an actor known for Forrest Gump and plenty of other projects, and he joins us to talk all about his faith and to reflect on the tragic loss of his son. That and much more. Let's welcome Gary to Newsmakers. Gary, I so appreciate you taking the time coming on with us today. Your family has gone through quite a, quite a bit recently with the loss of your son, Mac. When the reality set in for you that this was this was going to be it, how did you how did you process that? How did you you know was it prayer? What was sort of going through your heart and your mind in those in those moments? Oh, that was. This has been, I've said this to some friends, probably Stelio, you know, and some other friends that in all my 69 years, painful times, you know, that we all have, um, you know, different sour, sorrowful moments or painful moments along the way. Never, I have never experienced a sorrow and a pain like, like this in losing our son. And that morning, the night before was, was very rough in that not that Mac was in a lot of agony or, you know, suffering a lot and, you know, brutal and to watch, it was just, he was, he was beginning to, to let go. The fight was, was going out of him. He had a lot of trouble breathing. We had to put a breathing mask on him. That was, it's called a BiPAP. People use it for sleep apnea and whatever. And it just forces air down into your lungs. He didn't want to take that off at a certain point. It just, because he was having trouble breathing. And that was the night before I was up with him very late. I went to bed for about four hours, got up, talked to the nurse. There was no change. The pulmonary doctor walked in, sat down next to me. And up until that point, wherever he'd come in, we would be talking about, well, what, what could we try? You know, this time he just sat down and stared at me and, uh, I stared back at him. And then I, I just, I just asked him if I should start making calls. So I did. And, uh, that was about six, six thirty. And by 3.30, uh, about 3.25, Mac uh, let go. And we started to receive so much love. I mean, by the time I got home from the hospital, after I said goodbye to Mac, I, you know, we had the whole family there when he died. Um, everybody said their goodbyes. I stayed behind. There were things that I had brought there for him, um, you know, that I needed a pack up and I stayed behind myself. Um, uh, I sent everybody home, including, including, I had my daughters take our wife home. Um, I stayed behind and, and packed up and then take your time. I know that I so appreciate you sharing this because there are a lot of people who are going through this right now who have gone through it and they're struggling, you know, and I think, you know, the fact that you're being so open about it, it's really, it's inspirational, but I know it's difficult. These are not, these are the, the most horrific events that happen to us that, to then talk about them. You know, it's, it's not easy. And I appreciate you being willing to do that. I truly do. You know, I think, I think, because because Mac was at peace at the end and he he you know he he died feeling satisfied you know yeah with with what he had tried to do and he was happy in the hospital at the end he, um 
you know, I, I left him there and shut the door. I'll finish that where I was going with that. I, I shut the door and I went home. And by the time I got home, there were already two meal orders that had been delivered to the house. Uh, multiple recordings on my voice message. You know, my team went to work to notify our key people that needed to know right away what had happened. And within hours, we were receiving so much love and so much support. And um, after I posted the story, I mean, the it's incredible the amount of love that poured out to us after people read that the media picked it up. So it, it went all over the place, but social media picked it up and millions of people saw it. And we started to receive this outpouring of support and love and, you know, expressions of grief and sharing their own experiences of losing their own sons or daughters and, you know, just, we received a lot, a lot of support. That's not why I posted the story, but I felt, you know, we, we started a campaign to raise money at the Cordoma foundation and the link to the team Mac page is contained within that story. That's on the Gary Sinise foundation website. And it, you know, a lot of people from 2021 started, we, we put that up not to publicize it, but because we had friends saying, what can we do to help? How can we help? Sure. We, we put, we said, well, let's support the Cordoma foundation. They're, they're one of our greatest hopes that maybe something they will discover will be useful to us in our story and help Mac. So we created this fundraising campaign. So there were a lot of donors and a lot of messages there at that campaign. I knew that I had to notify them and tell them what had happened, that Mac had lost his battle but that we were going to keep that campaign going in Max honor. So once I knew, once I you know started writing that, you know, that message to our Cordoma foundation donors, I, I felt like the Gary Sinise foundation and people that have supported me and my work with veterans and all of that, they all deserve to know what, what's been going on in our family behind the scenes while I've been out there, you know, uh, you know, doing the mission of the Gary Sinise Foundation. So that's why we put it up there. Plus, it's an uh, inspirational story. I, I tried to, 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 I tried to, I tr tried to really emphasize Max, the inspiration uh, of, of his final days and his final months and, and what he left us, the get great gifts that have helped us through all of that has helped our family manage our own grief and, and pain. I appreciate you taking the time coming on with us and sharing. I know it's a difficult um, journey and story to share, but I know you've inspired many by doing so today. Appreciate your time, Gary. I sure appreciate it, Billy. Thank you very much. Please continue to pray for Gary and his entire family as they continue to navigate such a profound loss. We'll be back in just a moment with more Newsmakers. Welcome back to Newsmakers. Our next guest is Tal Heinrich. She's a spokesperson for Israel's Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, and she's here to talk about a number of topics. First and foremost, U.S. President Joe Biden's recent ultimatum and what conditions, if any, could be met for any potential ceasefire. Let's welcome her to Newsmakers to dive into all of these important issues. So just to dive right in here, world leaders increasingly questioning some of Israel's operations in Gaza. Why do you think the narrative has turned the way that it has of late? Well, Israel has taken unprecedented steps in the history of urban modern warfare to uh, elevate the suffering of the civilians in Gaza and to make sure that what we see is the minimal uh, civilian suffering and civilian casualty on the Palestinian side. But this is, this is what Hamas's strategy is entirely based upon. 
They want to maximize the civilian suffering and civilian casualties in Gaza because they, they, they want Israel to take the fire for their vile actions and methods of war using civilians and urban structure as uh, shields for their war machine. And they want the international pressure to be used as leverage against Israel in a way that will let them stay in power, live another day, and carry out another October 7th massacre. So, uh, I, I, unfortunately, many around the world are falling for their trap. Uh, they are playing right into Hamas's hands when they do so. It, what message do you think it sends when people say we need an immediate ceasefire and those terms? I'm sure Israel would be you know, amenable to that if the terms made made sense. What do you think that message sends, though, when the the sort of responsibility is placed on Israel and not so much on on Hamas? It serves their strategy. It serves their war machine. It incentivizes, in fact, people don't realize that, Billy, but in, it incentivizes the use of Hamas, of, of Palestinians as human shields. It incentivizes their, uh, you know, uh, stealing of the humanitarian aid because they see that this is working. They see that international pressure could be applied on Israel this way because of their actions and and again and let them live another day and stay in power now regarding a ceasefire there will be no ceasefire in gaza one that uh keeps the hostages in in, in gaza and uh, hamas in power that is simply unacceptable we took this decision as a nation that we will not live next to this terrorist enclave we defined very clear war, war objectives that hamas must be gone and all terrorists must come back home and that gaza can never pose a terror threat to us again well, and, and let me ask you this. What if U.S. policy did change as a result of, of the war, a disagreement maybe with how Biden is seeing it? How would that impact Israel and what Israel is doing in Gaza? You know, Billy, and I think I told you this before, support is great to have when you're fighting a war. You, you want moral clarity. You want global support on, our, on your side. But we're not fighting for support. We're fighting to stay alive. We're fighting so we can have a better future in the region for us and for, you know, the, the Palestinians, should they choose to, uh, you know, should they choose the path of peace? So uh, with or without international support, uh, including uh, American support, we will do what has to be done because we, we will not die. We will not commit public suicide. We will fight a war that must be fought for our survival. Final question for you, and I appreciate your time. I know you're, you've got a lot of media interviews today and this week. Um, obviously, Iran is very concerning and has been at the center of a lot of what we've seen happen in this chaos all the way down the line from October 7th before and after. Um, what is happening in terms of preparations? I know there are some concerns that Iran, Iran is stepping up their threats against Israel at this point. How is Israel preparing for the potential threats there? Thing. So you're right. Anywhere you look around the region uh, where you see bloodshed, where you see terrorism, you see chaos, uh, you'll find the footprints of, of Iran. They're using their proxies, if it's the Hamas, the Hezbollah, the Palestinian Islamic Jihad, the Houthis, a militias in Iraq, the same militias that target American bases. You know, just uh, over the past week, we had a, a drone launched from uh, Iraq uh, targeting a target, a military base in, in Elat, the southern city in Israel. So anywhere you, you look, it's it's Iran pulling the strings behind their axis of, of evil. And they're so dangerous now. Think of how much more dangerous they could, they could get if they ever acquire nuclear weapons, which will never allow that to happen. So... Uh, we are prepared. We are prepared, Billy. Um, and we will fight our enemies. Uh, you know, with the prime minister just before one of the war cabinet meetings this week, he said, anyone who tries to hurt us, anyone uh, who threatens to hurt us, we will hurt them. It's as simple as that. We don't have to uh, say everything that we do uh, on air uh, and on the record, but we do a lot. Well, I appreciate you taking the time, joining us and giving us these updates. We look forward to having you back soon. Be sure to continue praying for the peace of Israel and for the peace of all of the Middle East as so much chaos is brewing there. This is Newsmakers on the CBN News Channel. We'll be right back.
Welcome back to Newsmakers on the CBN News Channel. For our final segment, we are sitting down with Jeremy Dice. He's an attorney for First Liberty, and he's here to talk about how a church near the U.S.-Mexico border is in the middle of a legal battle, a battle to be able to continue serving and feeding the poor. Let's welcome Jeremy to Newsmakers to dive into that and more. Now, Jeremy, you have filed a complaint on behalf of a church out in Arizona over the claim that the government is preventing that church from giving food to the poor. Can you take us through what's going on here? Yeah, this is a little Baptist church, Gethsemane Baptist Church, right on the border in San Luis, Arizona. In fact, it's probably, you know, a par five away from the famous border wall there uh, in Arizona. And uh, here's a church that has for the last 25 or 30 years been present in that community and caring for its people by handing them food when they need it. Uh, And not just the city of San Luis, but people throughout the entire region, which are in desperate need of food at times, uh, ranging all the way from from, uh, San Luis up to Tucson and and around that entire area. And uh, people that are coming across the border often stop there on the way uh, into the the country, again, in, in great need for this food, and on top of all that, you have churches in Mexico that regularly cross the border, stop at the church, fill up a pickup truck worth of food, and go back into Mexico and feed churches uh, and people there in Mexico. So to say that this church is having a massive regional impact, feeding the hungry in its area would be absolutely correct and probably an understatement. Uh, but only recently has uh, Mayor Riddell there in San Luis become uh, opposed to the efforts of this church to care for those in their community. Well, let's talk about that because you mentioned 25 years going back to 1999, I believe, when this started and they've been doing this. And according to the pastor of that church, they've in fact even had moments purportedly of, of the government being involved, you know, people involved in city council helping hand out food during the pandemic, those sorts of things. So it seemed like there was a partnership of sorts or at least a favorability on behalf of the city towards this church um, at some point, did something change? You know, was the church something the church was doing in terms of how they handed the food out change? What, what perpetuated that shift? Well, the church has done what it has always done. And so there's really been no change on the end of the church. They've just been simply trying to care for people in their community. What changed, it seems, is the mayor. Uh, mayor Riedel was elected to office and uh, very promptly kicked the, uh, the church out of the city's warehouses. They had been using their warehouses for uh, storage of food until they could move it to their property to, to hand it out. Um, and and uh, all friendly relationships between the city and uh, this church seemed to, to cool real quick when she became the mayor there. Uh, and for reasons I'm still not entirely sure. Um, now they say it's because the, the pastor brings a semi-truck into the community with this food to unload it and to hand it all out. And that's been true, of course. Now, the ordinances in the town actually permit trucks to be able to be on that property for a period of time to unload uh, off their property, but that, that's perfectly fine. That's when they're on the side of the road. The church has actually pulled that truck onto their own property, which shouldn't be an issue at all. But even now bringing that truck into the church property or onto the property or even on the side of the road, which the law allows, is forbidden by the city. In fact, they have now ticketed him twice for even having a truck pass by even for five minutes outside of their church property. Now, you need to understand that just down the street, there are two Head Start programs. These are programs by the federal government to help out uh, people, uh, students in schools. They have a weekly delivery by semi-truck of food to those Head Start programs, and those trucks are perfectly fine and being permitted by the city to be there. It's only this church that is being singled out, ticketed and fined for trying to feed the hungry. Has the, you know, have the government officials at the center of this given any indication, any reason why, from what you understand, the relationship with the church has changed? No, not really. I, I haven't been able to determine exactly why that is the case, other than the fact that the mayor wants it a certain way. And the pastor is called to do something that she doesn't want to have him do at the location of what she's trying to do. Look, all this could clearly be easily resolved. I mean, there is a great need for solving this problem in the area of San Luis, Arizona, as well as many other parts of the country. Uh, this church actually provides food for many food pantries across the region as well. So it's, it's a central hub and ought to be a bright spot in the otherwise bleak area of San Luis, Arizona. But instead of supporting that ministry, 
in finding creative solutions to solve any concerns that may be out there. Uh, the mayor has ruled with an iron fist and come down very hard against this pastor in a way that, well, it just doesn't speak well of her relationship with the church. What is your hope? Obviously, this complaint is happening. The church has paused, you know, which is an important detail here that we've hinted at, but I want to say it again. They've paused their food distribution as this is going on, which I'm sure, again, is impacting a lot of people. What is your hope at the end of this particular lawsuit and complaint? Well, it's very simple. Our hope is that the church will be able to restore its ministry to feed hungry people in San Luis, Arizona and beyond. Today, because of Mayor Riedel, there are people that will not have a meal to, to enjoy this evening because this ministry does not exist. There are people that are very much hurting because this ministry has been forced to suspend itself because the government has told this church how to behave. And that's the real issue here. Uh, the First Amendment, federal law protects churches in their efforts to provide these types of services around the country. And here we have a mayor that is openly defying federal law, saying, no, 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 unless you conform to what I want a church to be like, you can't exist in this way. And, and you're going to be fined, and you're going to face charges, criminal charges, if you don't agree with me. That's the type of behavior that the First Amendment and federal law has been put in place precisely to restrain and make it difficult for the city leaders to do. This could all go away very simply if my, Mayor Riedel would just simply acknowledge this is a very valuable part of the community and look for good ways to make sure that it continues on into the future. Well, Jeremy, as always, appreciate you taking the time to break this case down for us. Thanks for your time today. My pleasure. Thanks so much for having me. We'll continue to cover Gethsemane Baptist Church's battle as it unfolds, and we'll be right back in just a moment with more Newsmakers. That's all for Newsmakers. Thank you for watching, and be sure to head over to the CBN News YouTube channel. That's where you'll find the full interviews that you saw on today's episode. Plus, you can check out our new Newsmakers podcast. It's pretty exciting. We have interviews Monday through Friday, one full interview every single day. You can subscribe to the Newsmakers podcast on your favorite podcast platform. As for this show, we'll see you again next week.